Hi, I'm David Locke, and this is my blog, Boots and Bow Ties, a blog about everything cooking, gardening, and home. And I have my guest with me. It's Brandon Grace, and he is a wine supplier and wine purveyor and beer purveyor from Southern Glazer. Tell us a little bit about Southern Glazer, and tell us a little bit about how you got involved in wine. Well, uh, I'm, we are one of the largest uh, beer, wine, and spirits distributors in America. Um, we're in multiple states, and we supply to the stores that you buy from and the restaurants that you go to eat um, and buy wine and beer and spirits from them. We're the suppliers for them, so I go around and, and work with them to decide what their alcohol options will be on their beverage menu. Um, I got into this because I've spent a long time in my life in, in dining and in hospitality. So this was just sort of the next step in the career to move to the distributor part of the equation instead of working you know, directly with customers in the retail setting. Fantastic. Well, I've asked Brandon to come in today thinking that as the holiday time approaches, as uh, Valentine's approaches, that when you go to the grocery store and you stand there with the myriad of choices and you have some uh, champagnes or sparkling wines that are $5 and some that are over $100, which one to pick. So talk to us a little bit about what is the difference between sparkling wine and what is the difference between that and champagne. Right. Now, so champagne refers to a very uh, particular sparkling wine that is made in the Champagne region of France, mm -hmm. which has certain techniques, certain grapes, and a terroir that reflects that, that, that area. Uh -huh. A lot of people use the term champagne to mean sparkling wine, mm -hmm. but hopefully today after we go through all of this, they'll understand uh, the nuances between these different options, uh -huh. and they'll be able to sort of see through the cloud and choose the right thing for their celebration. So it's champagne in air quotes. Exactly. So anything that's outside of Champagne, France, is sparkling wine. Right, and there's terms for all of those, and we'll, we'll share some of those today. Fantastic. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, price difference. So when we go to the grocery store and we see that wide price difference, why should we buy something maybe a little bit more expensive, and how do we go about choosing it? So there is a very wide Price difference. You can see stuff all the way from five dollars a bottle, which I don't recommend, <laughs> all the way up to several hundred dollars um, on very fine uh, vintage champagnes. Uh -huh. And uh, there is there are big price differences. Mainly, the reason why the ones that are more expensive cost more. Mm -hmm. We like to say it's a part of the luxury of time. Those bottles spend a lot more time fermenting and aging and really conditioning in the bottle in a cellar for a very long time. So they got to pay their rent a little uh -huh. bit. So they, you know, some of them can be in the cellar as long as 12 years. Oh, wow. So they have to, to make more with that champagne because it's taken longer to time to Correct. produce it. But there's a lot of really great options available out there that um, come from the houses that make these grand cuvee um, prestige brands. Uh -huh. They also make a brand that's going to be a little more accessible to the everyday budget. Uh -huh. It's just a matter of knowing how to pick those out. Um, but I think people really miss the boat by not including sparkling in their their parties or uh -huh. their celebrations or even everyday dinner with their family because it really lends a spirit of celebration and a festive mm -hmm. nature to anything that you bring sparkling to. So I suggest to make it a part of, of almost anything. It, it pairs well with any food. Oh, really? It can be an aperitif. Okay. It can be served with an entree. It can be served with dessert and sparkling will shine always. So make it a part of your, your decision. So, well, I serve it a lots of times as a cocktail. In right. place of a cocktail, I know when you go to Europe and you go to any restaurant, they usually have some type of sparkling wine immediately on the table. So I tend to serve it like that or I'll serve it with dessert, but I never had thought about serving it with the entree. So you can serve it with anything. Right. It has a quality where it, um, it, it pairs well with things because it has a very cleansing property to it, to mm -hmm. your palate. Okay. Especially with dessert, you'll notice this. If you're eating a rich chocolatey dessert, mm -hmm. if you take a sip of sparkling between each bite of that dessert, your mouth won't get so coated with those flavors, those rich flavors of the dessert. Okay. So each bite is like the first bite all over again. I had never thought about it as being a palate cleanser. Absolutely. Well, talk to us a little bit about the different types of sparkling you've brought today. So when we're talking about um, the differences, we're mainly talking about the differences in technique of how it's made uh -huh. and the location it's made in. Uh -huh. Those are the two things you're mainly going to concern yourself with. First pro tip of the day, mm -hmm. if it's $5 a bottle, it is probably not really a sparkling wine. It is a, <laughs> an amalgamation of carbonation and grape juice and alcohol 
meant to look like a sparkling wine, mm -hmm. but that's going to probably give you a little bit of a headache the next day because they're not made using these traditional techniques that we're going to talk about now. So you're going to look in the 10 to up range when you're buying a sparkling wine. So you're looking at basically if you're buying a $5 bottle, you're buying alcoholic soda. Correct. Correct. So you want to go with one of these that has um, a very traditional technique and how it's made that comes from real grapes and, you know, goes through the process and actually has something to offer you. So the first method and the, the one that you're going to find at the most reasonable price point um, is called the tank method. And now you will never see that on the label. They don't usually say that. But what this means is, is that all sparkling wines start as dry still wines. Mm -hmm. They go through their initial fermentation and then you have just a regular wine like they would normally bottle in a still wine bottle. Mm -hmm. What makes sparkling wine different is it goes through a secondary fermentation and there's two different ways to do that. The first way is the tank method, like I said. Mm -hmm. This is where all the still wine is put into a pressurized, se uh, sealed, stainless steel tank. Mm -hmm. Now, fermentation automatically has two byproducts, alcohol, Mm -hmm. and CO2. Normally in a still wine, that CO2 is allowed to escape into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. In that sealed, pressurized, stainless steel tank, the CO2 gets dissolved back into the wine. And that's what makes the bubbles. That's what makes the bubbles. And so when it's done, it's done very quickly in the tank method. It can be just a matter of a couple months or so. Oh, really? That's why those, um, those wines don't usually have vintages on them. Okay. Because they don't they don't take many years. They take just a few months. Oh, right. it, it gets um, fermented, secondary fermentation in the tank, and then uh -huh. filtered and bottled, capped, corked, and it's sold to you. The most famous form of tank method sparkling wine would be Prosecco. Yes, that, I knew that when I had done some research for another blog. Exactly. <laughs> so one of the things that's great about the tank method is it keeps that sort of fresh, lively, um, fruity quality of the sparkling wine. Uh -huh. And Prosecco is a great example of that. You also have uh, Moscato de Asti. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Mezza de Mezza um, Glacial Italian Bubbly from the Dolomite region of Italy, um, which was, is done the same way. But these, these wines are going to keep their fresh and fruity qualities. They're uh -huh. going to have less contact with with their spent yeast, which is called lees. Mm -hmm. So their their flavors are not going to have some of the flavors you'll get from this other method we're going to talk about. A little bit second. more buttery like, right. and more minerality. With, uh, yeah, I love Prosecco. I love it especially when it's hot. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's because it's a little bit more inexpensive, it's a good mixer. I use it for mimosas. Right. Or Bellinis. You know, it makes a great cocktail mixer because of that a little bit more rounded, uh, fruity flavor mm -hmm. than it has. Um, now, the, the, the counterpart to that is known as the traditional method or champagne method or method champenoise. You'll mm -hmm. see these different things. You'll always see this method on the bottle because it's something that the maker really wants to tell you that they're doing. This is a secondary fermentation. After the still wine is fermented the first time, mm -hmm. the, the wine is actually split, split off into its individual bottles. It goes into the bottle it's eventually going to be sold to you in, mm -hmm. but it gets put in there, the cork, um, a top gets put on it, and it gets put upside down in the cellar and in these huge racks. If you've ever been to one of these uh -huh. places, you've oh, seen I these huge racks. And every, and every day somebody comes through and turns the and bottle. twists it. Is it a quarter turn or a half a turn every day? Yeah. That person is known as the Riddler. The Riddler? Yes. And some of these wines will stay in this cellar configuration for many, many years. Oh, and what happens during that time period is the same thing that happens in the tank and the tank method, but it oh. happens individually in the bottle. So you're and actually buying the bottle that it was fermented in. Correct. And then as it's fermenting, the yeast that is being spent after it's done its job, it falls to the neck of the bottle upside down, mm -hmm. but it has a lot more contact with the wine as they're riddling it and stuff. Uh -huh. So it adds the flavors, what we call autolytic flavors. Okay. It's going to be more bready, more biscuity, you know, these toasty flavors. That yeast bread that you can taste and I always think it smells a little right. yeasty. So... It's going to add a little different flavor profile. It also will raise the alcohol a little bit. The, oh, I didn't know that. The, the, the bottle method tends to be just a tad higher in alcohol, which Ooh. creates it to be even more dry. Oh, okay. Um, so you get this completely different flavor. And like I said, some of the prestige brands like Dom Perignon, they will be in the bottle for like a decade. Oh, wow. Right now, we are currently selling the 2008 um, vintage of uh, the Dom Perignon. That's amazing to think about. The farmer is growing the grapes that someone is not going to consume 
for a decade. Correct. That's that's incredible to think about that. Well, tell us what is meant by the word brute, because I know you see that sometimes on a bottle, and then you see so many different um, uh, terms on the bottle. So tell us what's meant by brute. Brute is a, a is a sort of measure of dryness. Mm -hmm. There is not really an official measure that they have to have. Usually. Um, it is a measure of residual sugar, how much sugar is left in the wine after it's done with its okay. fermentation, and how sweet it would be to your palate. Mm -hmm. Brut is gonna be the driest. Um, they'll be extra dry, and then you will see sect, um, mm -hmm. which means a sweeter uh -huh. wine. Um, so you, you see these terms, and they're somewhat relative, but brut is the driest, and the, the most popular, I think, of, of all these, of these um, sparkling wines. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, we talked about vintage versus non-vintage uh -huh. champagne or sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. A vintage is when they take a particular year and all of those bottles have the exact same year's harvest in them. Mm -hmm. They only do this on really spectacular harvest years. Okay. You only have two or three vintages per decade. Mm -hmm. on average. Okay. Sometimes they get lucky and they'll have a couple in a row. Okay. But for the most part, you'll see one every five, six, seven years. And those are very special ones that spend a very long time in the cellar mm -hmm. really pulling out the, know, the expressive yeah. qualities of those grapes and making it something really special. But... Even though you may be looking at those and going, I don't know if I want to spend two or three hundred dollars. That's a lot. For that's a lot. Entertainment. Of lot. You have to think about it. it's entertainment. And I, I certainly think that those should be incorporated into your family celebrations, yeah. your weddings, your graduations. Get a great bottle of vintage, Definitely. and then get a marker. And everybody sign the bottle and oh, keep it as a trophy. Keep the bottle. That's yeah. a wonderful suggestion. But you don't want to have a two hundred dollar bottle of champagne on Tuesday night. No. Um, well, but, I mean, some people may, but you uh, might. not in my budget. It's <laughs> not in my mind either. Well, Brandon, what are um, one or two other things that you think we need to know that we haven't told our followers when they go to the grocery store, they go to the wine shop, and they're picking it out, and maybe they don't have help? So one of the things that you can look for for a really nice bottle, and these will typically run around 30 to $60 uh -huh. a bottle, you can get really nice non-vintage uh, sparkling wines. Oh, so are they mixing the different they vintages? They mix different vintages together to sort of have a consistent product every year. Okay. Look for one of those made by uh, one of the really famous houses like Moet and Chandon. Yes, yes. Or uh, G.H. Mum. This is a wonderful example of that. Um, it is. This is the um, Grand Cordon, it's called. Uh -huh. And they certainly make wonderful vintage champagnes that would cost you a lot, but you should be able to pick up a bottle of this for around $40 or so. I had, my wife and I had this on our honeymoon night, our first uh, night as a married couple, and I still have the little cork. I couldn't keep the bottle, but I still have the little cork in my secretary, so it's a, a great little remembrance. Uh, there, it always makes this special night. And then the other thing I wanted to point out was is there's a lot of great options from places other than France and Italy. Uh -huh. This is a Washington State. Uh, Brut Sparkling from Chateau Saint Michel. Uh huh. Um, this is uh, the Conundrum Sparkling, I've had that. I've had which that. is a um, a wonderful option if you're looking for a really wonderful sparkling that is not going to break the bank. And it's from California. And that's from California, yeah. And then here's a really interesting. This is a sparkling Shiraz out of Australia. I have had that one time before in Beaufort, South Carolina, and that is such a unique. Um, so it's a red wine. sparkling wine. So. I mean, you have a lot of options, so as you're looking around, the things you want to look at to select is you're looking for how was it made, was it tank method, or was it bottle mm -hmm. uh, fermentation, where is it from, um, and, you know, look and see if you're not looking for a vintage necessarily, just grab a great bottle of non-vintage from a prestigious house and you should have a really great time. Oh, those are wonderful tips. Well, Brandon, I want to say Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. And Happy New Year to my followers. And y'all enjoy some sparkling wine or some champagne with your family. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.